In the early hours of Friday, the 2nd of July, 1937, a 39-year-old aviator by the name of Amelia Earhart departed from Leigh, New Guinea, with the sole intention of becoming the first pilot ever to circumnavigate the globe around the equator. Amassing many major accomplishments and being notorious for her persistence and courage, it seemed Earhart was set to add yet another achievement to her list, yet Earhart would never set foot on land again. Despite subsequent radio contact during the latter hours of the flight, search efforts to recover the aircraft's wreckage would be unsuccessful, shaping a mystery in its wake. 82 years on, and one question still baffles aviation enthusiasts and investigators alike. How did this intrepid, record-breaking pioneer in aviation inexplicably disappear without a trace? The year is 1927, and an amateur aviator by the name of Charles Lindbergh safely lands in Paris, France, following a 34-hour flight from New York to become the first ever pilot to perform a solo transatlantic flight. Lindbergh became an overnight hero. He received both the Distinguished Flying Cross and the Medal of Honor for his efforts, but along with that, fashioned a new public enthusiasm for flying. Before long, demand in having a woman cross the Atlantic Ocean began to increase, and soon thereafter, front pages far and wide declared that one Amelia Earhart was granted a place as a passenger on a transatlantic voyage a year later. After landing on an estuary near the Welsh village of Burryport, Earhart's 1928 transatlantic crossing became an outstanding success, promoting her straight into the heart of the public eye. Four years later, in 1932, and with four more records under her name, Earhart set out from Harbour Grace, Newfoundland, in a bid to cross the Atlantic once more, this time, however, alone. Following a problematic 15-hour flight, Earhart triumphantly touched down in Culmore, Northern Ireland. Despite being some 950 kilometres away from her intended destination of Paris, she had achieved what she had set out to do nonetheless, becoming the first woman and second pilot ever to cross the Atlantic Ocean alone, etching her name even deeper into the record books. Come 1936, Earhart had thoroughly established herself as a sensation in the public eye, hence why, during that year when nothing notable appeared in the papers with her name boldly labelled alongside, it was speculated that she was preparing a stunt that would be talked about for years to come. The idea to perform a round-the-world flight was proposed by Earhart in early 1936, and immediately the planning and preparations for the audacious voyage began. She felt that she had one more good flight left in her system, and hoped that this remarkable final venture would prove to be a fitting conclusion to years of record-worthy accomplishments. The aircraft chosen to tackle this daring feat was a Lockheed Model 10 Electra, operated in normal circumstances as a commercial airliner. However, Lockheed agreed to construct a brand new Model 10 tailored specifically to Earhart's demands, which were as such. Four auxiliary fuel tanks installed just behind the cockpit in the passenger compartment, a navigator's post set up just to the rear of that, removal of all passenger windows, the installation of a gyroscopic autopilot, and finally, additional radio and navigation equipment. This all meant that the modified Electra 10E Special, as it was named, would carry roughly 3,600 litres more fuel than the original 10A, adding 2,200 kilograms extra to the gross weight of the aircraft. The original flight plan consisted of multiple stops along a westbound route along the equator. However, a crash during takeoff in Hawaii just days into the voyage meant that the flight path had to be altered to an easterly route instead, in order to counteract changes in weather patterns that would ensue later in the year.
On June 1, 1937, Amelia Earhart and her flight navigator Fred Noonan departed Miami, Florida to publicly begin their round-trip voyage around the globe. Over the next 29 days, the pair covered some 35,000 kilometers in the air, stopping a total of 20 times on their journey across five different continents. In late June, the Electra finally touched down in Ley, New Guinea, in order to make essential preparations for the 11,000 km stretch over the Pacific. With the majority of this leg over the ocean, and with only small islands in between them and the safety of success, this would be the most strenuous section of the whole trip so far. At 10am local time on the 2nd of July, Earhart was finally cleared for takeoff and departed Ley heading eastbound into strong headwinds and overcast skies. Due to the unpredictability of the weather in the region, a plan to have accurate weather updates and frequent location monitoring would be vital in order to keep the pilots out of harm's way. The radio operator at Ley would broadcast weather updates to Earhart on an hourly basis in order to keep her updated with the conditions. Noonan would rely on celestial navigation, a form of position tracking where visible objects in the sky such as stars or the sun act as markers to take angular measurements with as a means to estimate their location. Because the atoll was so remote, a cutter-class patrol boat named Itasca was deployed to anchor on the coast of Howland in an effort to provide necessary navigation and communication support. The vessel did manage to establish radio contact with the Electra not long after its departure, and remained in intermittent contact thereafter. As dawn broke, the crew members on board the Itasca became increasingly concerned with the whereabouts of Earhart's flight. Throughout the 19 hours she had been in the air, the Itasca failed to maintain a secure two-way radio connection. Communication was made with Earhart, albeit in extremely irregular intervals, and voice transmissions were frequently distorted with loud static, often making interpretation of the messages a challenging affair. At 7.42am, nearly an hour after previous contact with the aircraft was made, Earhart was heard clearly over the ship's loudspeaker. We must be on you, but cannot see you, but gas is running low. Almost exactly an hour later, at 8.43, Earhart made a final attempt to contact the Itasca, desperately stating, we are on the line of position 157337. We'll repeat this message on 6,210 kilocycles. Wait. This was the last known contact made with the aircraft. Or rather, this was the last recorded contact made by just one of the radio operators on the ship. You see, two separate logs of Earhart's communications were recorded on board the Itasca, and on the position 2 log, a seemingly rushed entry marked as a questionable transmission was crammed in on the same line as the 843 message. This further states, we are running on the line north and south. If this was, in fact, the final transmission made by Earhart, and not just some simple misunderstanding, this could provide significant information towards the search for the wreckage. The question is, when was this transmission actually heard? After reviewing the evidence, it seems plausible that this final transmission did in fact occur after the 843 transmission, rather than during it as the transcript suggests. It is clear that the additional transmission was inserted after the rest of the document had been typed out, as is evident by the overlapping text and the abbreviation for North and South being offset to the line above. Furthermore, there is evidence to determine the approximate time Earhart's message was received. On the back of an unsent radio note, a press correspondent by the name of James Carey jotted the words, 8.55 last on, ran out of gas about 8.20, 9 o'clock still in air. Although he didn't hear the message firsthand, this supposed 8.55 message is also backed up by the radio man George Thompson, who was in the radio quarters during that time. All things considered, it is safe to assume that Earhart's final desperate call was received by the Itasca at 8.55am.
With an hour going by and no response from the Electra, the crew of the Itasca began to assume the worst, and at 10.40 local time, they swiftly began the search. From a line of bearing crossed by the plane earlier in the flight, search personnel concluded that it was highly unlikely that the aircraft ditched within a 60 km radius of Howland Island. With this in mind, searchers agreed that the most logical area of search would be located within two concentric circles around the island, one being 60 km away, and the other around 320. However, as the given search area was so vast and no other beneficial details were conveyed to the Itasca by this point, the initial search came up empty-handed. By July 4th, jurisdiction of the search fell into the hands of the US Navy, and through to July 16th, the Itasca searched an extensive expanse of ocean southwest of Howland, but yet again, no evidence of a wreckage was discovered. Several other naval vessels remained searching the area until July 18th, when, after spending $4 million and scouring 400,000 square kilometers of ocean, the US government finally called off the operation. In the wake of the disappearance, headlines around the globe declaring Earhart's vanishing circulated rapidly, and with months passing by with no new revelations, it seemed certain that Amelia Earhart had just made headlines for the final time. Still without any obvious clues as to where and why it happened, the broken hearts of the world could only ask, what happened to Amelia Earhart? Right from the onset of this news, speculations and theories erupted, some being quite conceivable and some perhaps a little less. One of the first suppositions, along with being the most simple to explain, was that Earhart and Noonan exhausted their fuel load while frantically searching for the island, eventually crashing into the Pacific Ocean and sinking in the 5,000 metre deep waters northwest of Howland. Despite the initial inconsistencies with this theory, decisions made by Earhart and Noonan during the flight provide significant evidence to consolidate it. In a report written by Guinea Airways manager Eric Chater, it is revealed that the Model 10 Electra was carrying 1,100 US gallons, or about 5,000 litres of fuel, upon departure. This, according to fuel consumption figures calculated in early 1937, meant that the plane should have been expected to fly some 24 hours and 9 minutes before fuel starvation. Therefore, by the time Earhart made her final transmission on the day of the disappearance, she should have realistically had a couple of hours of fuel, at least, in reserve. Though, after doing a bit of digging, that argument might not be as simple as it sounds. If we refer back to the Chater report, five hours into the flight, Earhart states that she was flying at 10,000 feet. 3,000 feet higher than previously stated an hour earlier. This sudden increase in flight level, believed to be done in an attempt to avoid a storm, would require a prolonged period of high thrust, burning up any excess fuel the Electra had in reserve. Such a rapid ascent of its nature, accompanied with the 27 mph headwinds that were present that day, led investigators to conclude that it would in fact be possible, for the Electra to run out of fuel prior to reaching the island. Despite the fact it had been endorsed by the US government as the official conclusion to the disappearance, the simplicity of the crash and sink theory has deterred many from perceiving it as the truth. Many alternative theories, therefore, have been proposed over the years, some even suggesting that Earhart and Noonan may have been alive during the authorities' frantic search for their very lives. The Gardner Island hypothesis, as it has come to be known, assumes that after failing to make visual contact with Howland Island, Earhart and Noonan carried on along a southeasterly bearing until they came across Gardner Island, landing safely and only then succumbing to the elements. This theory is rather widely accepted, with some of the evidence from the preceding flight supporting it. 
First of all, Earhart's radio transmission at 8.43, we are on the line of position 157337, suggests that at the time of transmission, the Electra was flying along a northwest to southeast navigational line that intersects Howland. In other words, if the pair were unsuccessful in locating their destination, they would fly along that line, either northwest or southeast, in an attempt to find it. If Earhart and Noonan did indeed fly southeast, they may have come across Gardner Island instead, and with fuel levels dwindling, ultimately made the decision to perform an emergency landing there. From then on, they could only hope that search crews would come across the uninhabited island and eventually rescue them, though evidently nothing of the sort did occur. Corroborating evidence to support the fact that they may have survived on Gardner Island has also emerged in the form of further radio transmissions picked up after the vanishing. Assisting radio operators received 121 messages over the 10 days following the disappearance, and of those, at least 57 could have potentially originated from the Electra. Directional bearings were able to be extracted from six of the radio messages, and from that, four crossed the vicinity of the Phoenix Islands. Moreover, the timing of these messages indicates that Earhart may have radioed in when the tide on Gardner Island was at its lowest. You see, the majority of the probable radio calls occurred at night, when the tide was out, suggesting that the aircraft may have touched down on a section of the island solely accessible at low water. Research into the area, conducted by the International Group for Historic Aircraft Recovery, or TIGAR, discovered that the surface was dry at low tide, and suitable for landing the Electra in a strip about 50 meters wide. The location for this rudimentary airstrip could also count for the lack of a wreckage, as it is situated adjacent to the reef edge, followed by a drop of about 4,000 meters. If Earhart did indeed land on Gardner Island and was unable to taxi to a safe location, the alternating tide may have eventually lifted the Electra off the reef and submerged it, leaving Earhart and Noonan alone with no means of contact. That being said, there are some undeniable inconsistencies concerning this hypothesis, with a lot of it based on circumstantial evidence. If we take the official crash and sink conclusion into account, and accept that the calculations regarding the fuel consumption are indeed accurate, it would have been as good as impossible that the Electra endured the extra 650 kilometers to Gardner Island. In addition, one week after the disappearance, the US Navy ordered three seaplanes to conduct a reconnaissance flight over the Phoenix Islands to see if there are any obvious signs of habitation. After searching the atoll, the flight crew reported no signs of Earhart, Noonan, nor her plane, and over numerous expeditions over the years, neither did Tiger. With all of the theories that have surfaced throughout the years about where Amelia Earhart came down, it is often easy to overlook why she did. Of course, we know fuel exhaustion was the utmost terminal factor, but the question I'm asking rather is, why didn't Earhart and Noonan find the island in the first place? The Electra should have had enough fuel to make it to Howland if everything went accordingly, despite the commotion the weather caused, yet it didn't. We do know they were close, however. During the final few hours on board the Itasca, radio operators reported Earhart's calls to be getting stronger and stronger, so much so that eventually a crew member rushed out on deck, believing that he would indeed see the aircraft approaching, but again, nothing was heard nor observed. To know why this flight became Earhart's last, we must examine the decision making made by both pilots from the beginning of their round trip right down to the very last radio transmission. Before the flight commenced in Oakland, it was noted that Earhart was relatively unfamiliar with the modern radio equipment that the aircraft was outfitted with, 
and to exacerbate her susceptibility to confusion, she failed to take a test to verify her radio competence before the journey began. What's more is that Earhart's unfamiliarity led to a certain ignorance regarding the limitations of the equipment. Before the trip, she removed the 500kHz antenna from the aircraft, a frequency which would have been compatible with the Itasca's low frequency direction finding equipment. If this antenna was left attached and functional, the Itasca may have been able to generate a bearing on the Electra and guide them safely to Howland Island. To make matters worse, Earhart nor Fred Noonan were able to use Morse code, and so in a bid to save weight, they abandoned their Morse code keys, consequently relying on operators to use voice transmissions. This is critical because in 1937, the standard format for air traffic communication was Morse code, as well as being favoured by the crew on board the Itasca. Voice transmissions, on the other hand, were often unreliable and difficult for operators to understand, meaning for the radio operators that day, establishing a stable two-way connection with the Electra was not far from a nightmare. Noonan's reliance on celestial navigation throughout the flight may have also contributed to their disappearance. You see, celestial navigation is never always perfect, Light refraction through the atmosphere, mathematical mistakes, and obstructing clouds all make for questionable readings, and during the flight, overcast conditions were indeed reported by Earhart. If you were able to obtain a fixed position using celestial navigation, you must consider the area of uncertainty that comes with it, and in Noonan's case, there was a 10 nautical mile radius around each celestial fix. If the pilots failed to find a definitive marker to verify their location, this area of uncertainty would prove to be problematic as the flight went on. The uncertainties would accumulate over time and soon, Noonan would, and most likely did, depend on potentially inaccurate assumptions. Ten hours into the flight, a call made by Earhart was picked up by a radio operator at Nauru Island, verifying that she had a ship in sight ahead. The USS Ontario and the MV Myrtle Bank were the only two ships in the vicinity at the time of the radio call, and both were in close proximity to Earhart and Noonan's estimated flight path. The Ontario was positioned at the halfway point of the route, acting as a marker for Earhart to use, though no one on board that ship reported any sound of a plane at that time. The Myrtle Bank, on the other hand, was a commercial vessel and had nothing to do with the flight procedures. However, a crew member on watch that night did report the sound of a plane matching the time frame in which Earhart reported lights ahead. Taking that into account, it seems likely that the vessel Earhart spotted was the Myrtle Bank, and if this were the case, it could be possible that the Electra had deviated onto a more northerly flight path. Assuming this minor shift in heading went unnoticed, subsequent calculations made by Noonan to determine their position would be completely false and over several hundred miles, this slight error could have been the catalyst to their unfortunate demise. The culmination of inadequate equipment and unfortunate flying conditions, I believe, justifies the lack of a conclusion after 82 years of searching, speculation, and the scratching of many heads. Without the existence of a confirmed wreckage, the fate of Earhart and Noonan is more or less undeterminable. Nevertheless, ideas developed by years of exploration and research help many to come to their own conclusions about the mystifying vanishing. Some believe that Earhart was a spy for the US government, ditching her plane deliberately near the Marshall Islands in order to allow the government to perform a reconnaissance flight, while masquerading it as a search for a downed aircraft. They were eventually captured and, depending on the version of the theory you pursue, either executed or released after the war under a false identity. Others believe that an alien abduction occurred, but it, it's probably best to veer away from that conspiracy before I start exhausting my tinfoil supply. With the little evidence we do have as of writing this, however, my best guess goes along the lines of the crash and sink theory. It just seems the most plausible with all the factors taken into consideration with the winds experienced during the flight, accompanied with the lack of accuracy present in celestial navigation, the idea that they simply drifted too far north approaching the Howland navigational line just appeals to me. 
It could be possible that after failing to realise their mistake, they began their approach only to find Howland gone, ultimately giving up and going back the way they came after believing they had passed it. In reality, carrying on probably would have just saved their lives. Privately funded searches are still being proposed today in an attempt to determine the fate of Amelia Earhart, and perhaps sometime in the future, we may finally receive a conclusion to this near-century-old mystery. But until that time, the best we can do is just put our best guesses forward and wait. Thank you.